tell the people on the newsroom floor. Okay. So go ahead and just okay, tell me. Are you ready? Okay. Sure. Um, well, we were having, we were on a horrible deadline. I mean, we had an impossible situation anyway. They had already set the president's speech in time. Jim Lair had done a big story on the security. Everything was ready because they pushed the deadline back. Uh, that was the home edition, the final edition, to 1.30. And so that was a half an hour later than usual anyway. So you imagine what we were doing right there at that moment. Uh, we were grabbing me up. I was taking an advance speech of our story from the women's editor, editor Vivian Castleberry, who was at the t trademark. And she was dictating to me, um, Dallas rolled out the red carpet today for President John F. Kennedy. And I was still fully typing away. I was sitting on the rim. Mm -hmm. He had a big rim that sure, faced the right. yeah. <laughs> city's ass. And so Ken Smart was exactly opposite of me. But um, he looked down. He picked up. I knew the hotline rang. And I knew that was to the police station. And so he picked it up. I never heard it ring before. I usually they called in just like any other reporter. And he put it down, and he stood up, and he was right about as far, maybe 12 feet from me or something, or 15 at the most. And he was looking out into space, and he said, triple underpass, shooting the president. And it was just, they simply all hell broke loose. I mean, every photographer in the photo lab, and I didn't know we had that many stuff back there. <laughs> One of my favorites was given me the great assignment of souping everybody's film that day, and he was one of the best photographers we had. But Bob Jackson was already with the uh, press crew going, uh, going to be in the motorcade. But the rest of them all went for the elevators and the stairs. And <laughs> I don't think Manziotti, who, who was our chief uh, photo chief, gave any assignment. It was just a matter of get the hell out of town here. So, um, the odd thing that happened to me is that my my fingers wouldn't move. <laughs> I thought, my God, I'm paralyzed. Here, <laughs> something's happened to the president, and I'm paralyzed. But, but my first thought was, we have to get this job done. And so I just took a deep breath, and then within about five minutes, Featherston came. Uh, I got a call, and Jim Featherston had found Mary Marmon and Jean Hill. Um, in Dealey Plaza, and this is going to be shown to your your fellow newsmen. Maybe they'll appreciate what Jeff Feather said to me that day. Uh, he didn't realize for years that I was his rewrite man, but when he did, he remembered what happened. But that's, I'd never mentioned to him what he really said to me. He said, Connie, you know I'm over the hill physically and sexually and mentally. Can you talk to these? I have to. Can you talk? Go ahead. I'm over the hill, you know, physically, sexually, and every other way. Can you talk to these two women while I hold these reporters <laughs> off? And I never told Feather about that later on. I thought, that's interesting, Feather. I didn't know that. Anyway, I am I was a widow, and uh, my husband had died just the year before. So uh, I like the cute guys. Feather was not one of them, but he was a nice guy. So anyway, I talked to the two women, and uh, Mary Mormon was very somber. Very uh, not composed. At first, she was shaken, and so she. But I, we finally established that she lived in my neighborhood, or not too far from me. So she began to loosen up. Jean Hill was very excited, <laughs> and as I said, her story began to sound like shooting at OK Corral. And of course, I had no frame of reference. We didn't know anything. All I knew is what Ken Smart had said. So when she said they were shooting back up the the hill. Or the known the grass they know. I had to take that as the story. I mean, when that's the story given to you, you type it that way. Only I found a better verb. I found pepper instead of fire. I had him peppering shots up the hill. But anyway, um, and I also reported on the fluffy white dog because that's what she thought she saw. And uh, then there was an interval, and what I was doing was looking over AP reports, looking for local angles that the reporter might follow up on, and there really weren't many. There were only about 17, I found later, 17 or 18 original stories done that day, and about two wire stories carried. Interestingly enough, one of the wire stories printed that way 
was that Bobby Kennedy had stated that he would not quit his job to help his brother win the next election. <laughs> and that ran in the same thing as the assassination. I don't know. Gosh, you know, but he didn't know anything about it. Anyway, at 3 o'clock or 3.30, <clears throat> they called across the room and they'd moved me from the room back into the room, so I was just working steadily. Um, it, and asked that I want to talk to the doctors. And I'd written in my book, so I really didn't, because I, my expertise was legal and uh, political. And I didn't know much about anatomy, and my husband had died, and I didn't want to particularly try to figure it all out in somebody. But anyway, um, I was the only one to take it, so I did talk to him. I talked to Kim Clark and Malcolm Perry. And of course, it wasn't a conference call. They talked back and forth and back and forth. And um, Dr. Cl uh, Dr. Perry said that the neck wound was an entrance wound. And then I somehow had the presence of mind, in fact I did with the women too, to ask where had the shots come from. And I asked them the same thing. And Perry said, well, he just knew that it was an entrance wound. And Dr. T Clark said that the head wound was a, either a tangential wound, tangential, or an exit wound. But he didn't really precisely answer my question. And then I asked him again, so I repeated it and then asked him what they said. Okay, that was, yeah, I hyped it up in about 15 minutes and that was it. In the first part of the afternoon, they were, the comedy boys were coming over to our desk instead of us going to the end basket. And you know, there is a <laughs> perpetual end basket. And um, we'd go throw our stories in there and keep the carbon. But the copy boys were coming to our desk, t and we had to tear the page off the, the lever to hold the paper down and give them whatever we had, and then remember, remember where we left off. And so, <laughs> whatever that last word was, and you focused on that. So it was really hectic, but by 3.30 it was a little calmer. And so I, I, I thought, well, I got through that okay, except I really couldn't think of the, of the medical term for the Adam's apple. So, Dr. Perry told everybody it was the Adam's <laughs> Anyway, um, then more work. They brought in a huge carton of restaurant uh, tray with the sandwiches. At first the building was sealed off, I insist. Ken Smart can't remember that it was, but I know no one could get in, even our own reporters. Now they uh, were getting Why in. Was uh, what? Why was that just? Because they were afraid there might be a coup. A, a take over the whole country. We, we did that. I didn't. I didn't know this, but um, that's the reason behind it. You think that was their reasoning? Well, Lyndon Johnson thought this too, and um, or at least said he did. And since they had they had an idea of how much blood there was, I mean, perhaps there was more than three shots, you know, or something like that. They they couldn't rule that out. So they cut out, shut down the phone, so we had no incoming calls uh, for a while, and sealed the doors. But my children remember to this day that I called home and said, "Kids, I can't get out," <laughs> and because uh, I normally would be home around five. And then later on that evening, I went out and did a mood story. They asked me to do that, and I took a, a photographer along. We walked up and down. And and the mood of Dallas was very somber, very, uh, uh, the people were not happy, fully, and to, the, but they were afraid. I keep hearing this fear, but I, I wasn't exercised, I didn't feel it. And, uh, but they were closing down restaurants early and all that sort of thing. And then, as I said, I stopped in front of this club where this woman jumped out and said, I didn't think he'd close for anything. And there was this large sign with the bloody red dripping letters closed. But I think those letters were sort of ominous to me. It didn't, I don't know, fear arose, but I just had the feeling this thing is it's not good. You know, this is the, it, not that I, I already knew that the assassination was, had occurred, but it occurred to me there might be other things going on that I didn't want to be in. Okay. But we did stop there. Um, the reason I mentioned stopping at Ruby's Club is because um, on Saturday, and I have to say now it's Saturday, first I thought it was Friday night that I saw the wound story and where there had been an added sentence. A doctor admitted there could have been only one wound. Well, what's wrong with that sentence? It has no attribution. You don't know who said it. You don't know why they were there. 
in what relation to the other two doctors? Would you write a sentence like that? No, I didn't, and I knew I didn't write it. And then it made it sound like there were, you know, there, there was uh, just one wound connected. Now the doctors had said they couldn't tell if there was any connection between them inside of, inside of the anatomy, but I understood that part and quoted it. But anyway, I saw that that sentence, and I called the city desk, and I either talked to Ken Smart or Tom O'Pear, he was the first assistant city editor, and asked who had put it in there, and they said it was the FBI, and I figured if anybody had authority, they did, and so I hung up, and um, that, that was pretty much it for years. Um, I couldn't, I didn't dare speak about it to anybody else, I, for, well, I did for a while, I refused to read the Warren Report. Jim Lair and I had constant arguments about it because he just loved to kid me as being a woman, you know, naturally you, you're going to believe everything you hear, <laughs> and then he uh, said, that I'll be glad to show you the Warren Report to show you where you're wrong, and so of course I said, Jim, forget it. And then we worked together on a steering committee and tried to form a union and failed Mr. Wimbley. <laughs> And at various other newspapers until the 1980s, I believe. And as I mentioned, I have a disability which began to crop up. Apparently, I've had it since birth. And uh, but it's never kept me from continuing to find this story. And then this lady over here, actually, Barb, <laughs> Barb Young Carnum, told me last year that uh, on the internet had been posted a message. Hey that Connie Critzberg was a little loony in the head, you know, or maybe that perhaps that I had, um, that either I had forgotten that I wrote that sentence, duh, or that my editors were kidding me. Well, it may pissed me off, frankly. So uh, I asked Barb to put a, a message on that. Neither one of those two things happened, thank you. Then I found out about all this John Sholkoff edition uh, collection of newspaper stories held in the basement in the archives of the Sixth Floor Museum. I never heard of, I didn't know there was an archive in the Sixth Floor Museum. So the, morning, the day of the convention, the, this conference last year, I called Gary Mack. He welcomed me with open arms. I went down there at what, about noon, Barb, or one o'clock, and uh, went through the entire collection where they put their white gloved hands turning me over. And they said like, they, they, they think they have like 88 stories, but they're just inserts or segments and things like that. And I found the bogus story. And, Barbara said, my friends told me that I looked like I was kicked in the stomach. But I did feel that way. I, I actually felt almost a little nauseous, like, God, here it is. And for one thing, it was so badly typed. It was, it, well, I've got a sample of it in the handout like I've given out today. And no newspaper reporter would ever have typed it that way. It's called duplicate. Well, I don't know. It doesn't have my name or anything on it. And then I've begun to reason since then that John Shokoff apparently collected most of those things Friday. Because this was kind of a surreptitious little operation of his to go around and collect stories that normally would be discarded because the day's news was over. And he told me that. I tried to talk to him on the phone. He said, I had a little sense of history. I think he had a little sense of <laughs> collecting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but eventually he did turn over to the Dallas Historical Society and then eventually to the Sixth Floor Museum. Um, so my story, so this one story says Watson, uh, the Mormon Hill story is mine, says Watson, financial, and it tells a uh, uh, candid, I see, Handed snapshot and goes as exactly as I typed it. Now, there's not my story as it went down. It, it, it was already downstairs, either it had been set in type or it was with line and type operators, I don't know, being typed, whatever. And so I know now what happened. It's very obvious that the, uh, the editor looked at that, wrote more, maybe thinking he could send that thing down, and then realized, my God, he had to correct every word. So he would then just retype the first three paragraphs, included the sentence they wanted, sent it down as a new description. It doesn't say new, it says lead to description of wounds. But that's clear that there's already a story there. Here's a new lead.
Wow. What was it like fun. being a woman journalist in the 60s, early 60s? It was fun. <laughs> I oh, loved Jesus. it. Jesus, <laughs> I mean, you have to be pretty ballsy to be a journalist. Well, of one of the boys, the hair. they treat you like one of the boys. Yeah, um, you had to learn to drink scotch and drink it, you know. <laughs> I could take my scotch and eat. In fact, that's kind of stuck with me. Uh, I, my favorite drink is a scotch mist. But any did you ever um, work with anybody? Ling Temple. I was here in the mid '60s and '65. My dad worked for Ling Temple a lot. Did you ever know Jim Lang? Or oh no, I knew of them, but I never covered society or anything like that. Uh, Val M was our society editor, and I covered the home furnishings market. Mm -hmm. And when I was on women's side, mm -hmm. and I. I really enjoyed that job because actually I liked writing about uh, home sure. decor and that sort of thing. But after I became in disfavor with the Herald, I went to Ardenwall, Oklahoma, and there I became a city hall, and courthouse, and police reporter. Oh, so right? I did, did it all. Yeah. So I've had to experience it with dead <laughs> Did you body. hang out at Jack Ruby's prior to the, the assassination? No. No, never went. No, um, was that not a great spot? Obviously, it was not a. Well, it was Women's funny. Uh, my friend Madeline Brown was there and used it as a gambling place. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it was a little bit lower class. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it would not, we would go to a bar, but we had the press club. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I lived days. at the press yeah, club. Know. This was, you know, they, they cooked great hamburgers mm -hmm. there. And we would entertain people at right. the press club. Right. So we really didn't go out to a lot of other clubs. Is Madeline going to be here today?